Hey, Amy, did it ask you to record it? Yep, so you're on stage. All right, I'm on stage. Hi, everybody. Um, so our next speaker, you've already seen her. Uh, she's right next to me, but she is our track leader. So Dr. Amy Elliott, she is currently an R&D staff member at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. She got her PhD from Virginia Tech's Dream Lab, where she led the world's first 3D printing vending machine, which I'm super excited about, and I'm wondering what's in, what's in this vending machine. But a little tip, she's also quite a bit famous, um, as she's a science personality on the Science Channel's Outrageous Acts of Science, um, explaining engineering and science behind viral video clips. And she was also a runner up for the Discovery Channel's Big Brain Theory, an engineering reality competition show. Super exciting. So Amy, the stage is all yours. All right, thank you so much. Let me get my technology in line here. All right, and you, Abby, tell me if my slides are up and you can hear me. Oh, I can see on my slides. So, um, I'll just start talking and you tell me if there's something wrong. <laughs> okay, great. You're good. Um, yes, thank you, Abby, for that introduction. Um, super excited to organize this track and to share with you the work that I've been doing um, at Oak Ridge and otherwise. And Abby mentioned that um, we made this 3D printing venue machine. It's a really fun project. Um, but uh, as all first gen systems, it had lots of issues. And so we had a lot of spaghetti printed and we had this hotline for graduate students and undergrads to come help fix the machines as as people were having issues. But um, it was a really great experience. And they've got, I think they're at version three or four now. And it's just um, been, a, been highly improved since I was there. But um, as, as Abby mentioned, I was uh, lucky to be selected to be on a reality show called Big Brain Theory on Discovery Channel. It's an engineering reality show. Um, super, super fun, super stressful. <laughs> But we got to build some really cool things like this waterfall elevator and i actually got second place in the competition um which is a lot better than i thought it would do <laughs> but um buzz aldrin was the judge for that the last competition where i got second when he saw where i placed he took me by the shoulders and he said i know what it's like to live in the shadow of another and uh so buzz aldrin equating me to himself like i'll take second place for that you know any day so really amazing experience and then um from there i got um to be on uh, the Science Channel show, Outrageous Acts of Science. Um, it's a fun clip show where we talk about, you know, these YouTube videos of people doing, you know, stupid stuff in their backyard or really cool, building cool stuff. We talk about the science of, okay, well, why did he fall on his face or how did she build that? And um, anyway, it's a really fun show. Um, and then recently I was able to uh, join the If Then Ambassadorship by AAAS. Um, it's, a, it's a program to promote women in STEM as role models. And so we got social media training, they 3D printed, they 3D scanned us and 3D printed us into life-size statues because apparently there aren't very many statues of women um, in, in the US. And so anyway, just amazing experience. It's a great initiative too. But my day job is as a scientist at Oak Ridge National Lab. It's really the best place to research uh, manufacturing. It's, um, we've, you know, the, the story of Oak Ridge, it started with the Manhattan Project. So um, it, was, it was a manufacturing challenge in itself. And since then, we have so many amazing science tools and scientists uh, to support manufacturing. So we have um, uh, the world's most powerful neutron imaging system that we can use to analyze our, our manufacturing processes, our microstructures, our, our metals, our materials. Um, and then we have the world's second fastest supercomputer, soon to be the first fastest again, um, to do a lot of our computational analysis, our data analytics that we use in manufacturing. Um, and so we, we've, we've um, decided to focus on manufacturing as a laboratory um, through our manufacturing demonstration facility, which, which is where I work, uh, because of this challenge that we have in manufacturing today. A lot of our manufacturing has options to us. Uh, our OEMs, our um, equipment manufacturers have transitioned to late stage production, and that early stage R&D has been pushed to the supplier. So we have this massive decentralization of our manufacturing research and a lack of that place-based innovation. So um, at Oak Ridge, we're most well known for our plastic BAM, as Jen mentioned. Um, BAM stands for Big Area Additive Manufacturing. So it's just a really big 3D printer. It's got a big extrusion nozzle. It, we extrude pellets instead of filament. Um, it does hundreds of pounds an hour. Um, so we've done these demonstrations, 3D printing a life-size car chassis 
uh, with local motors. You can see the Strati there. Um, we've done demonstrations uh, 3D printing a Shelby Cobra. So the Strati looked 3D printed. The Cobra does not. We finished it, painted it to look like a normal car. And then we've done lots of demonstrations. And one of them is this um, Amy house. <laughs> it's additive uh, manufacturing integrated energy. It was a confusing name because there were conversations with like, okay, are we talking about house Amy or person Amy? Um, but anyway, so the house powers the car and the car powers the house and they're both 3D printed. Uh, it's an off the grid concept. Um, so these are really neat demonstrations. Um, you might be thinking to yourself, okay, but I'm not really going to be driving a 3D printed car. Um, why use 3D printing? Um, so I wanted to kind of tailor this talk to the broader audience. Um, some of you may have already been, you know, been sold on 3D printing, but some of you may not. So let's talk about it. Um, so I wanted to frame this discussion around the 10 principles of additive manufacturing. If you haven't heard of these, um, it's a really great start um, to learn about 3D printing out of manufacturing, and they're in the book Fabricated. Um, I really like this book. It's a really nice forward-thinking book about um, additive manufacturing. So the first principle is what do we get for free in additive? We get complexity, so you can see the shape here. Um, if you're making the shape by carving out of a block, that's going to be almost, that's going to be impossible. But since the printer only sees the 2D cross-sections of this part at a time, then that manufacturing becomes much simpler. So the printer really doesn't care what you're printing. It can print whatever shape because it's only seeing that 2D cross section. We get variety. I'll talk about that in a minute. So you don't have to print the same thing over and over again. You can print whatever you want in the same batch in the next batch. And then you get precise replication. So like they 3D scanned us and printed us into statues. <laughs> you can use that with 3D printing as well. What we get for low cost or what is low with additive manufacturing is the waste. So we can put material only where we need it, not where we don't. Low skill. So if you operate 3D printers, you might be a little insulted by that because it does take some skill, but compared to most trades, most manufacturing technologies, that skill is low. And then low footprint and cost. So I'll give you an example of a printer that we're developing that has a much lower footprint than the, print, the thing it's printing. What is zero? Uh, zero assembly required, so we can use 3D printing and the complexity that we can afford to really reduce these very complex assemblies into single parts. So this is the famous Boeing or, or the famous GE uh, fuel nozzle. Um, just look it up. This is really still the best example of, of the uses of additive manufacturing. This is actually going on airplanes on engines, but this was something like 20 plus parts, um, you know, 20 plus assembly processes, they're all different processes, and very, very, very expensive. When you 3D print this, most of, pretty much all that goes away. You do have some final machining and your full insert, um, but you really, really reduce the, um, the time and, and resources required to make this part. Um, and then also, the, the cool part about this is you enhance the performance. So you can embed things into the, the, the um, design that you couldn't before that actually makes this more efficient. We have um, zero constraints. That's kind of a you know, hand wavy statement um, and zero lead time. So your, your printer does not need to be set up for a certain uh, geometry. It's always ready to print that. And then what's infinite? We have infinite shades of material. It's a bold statement, but I'll talk to you about how we're working on microstructure control um, and what that means uh, for our material properties. So let's go back to the beginning. Complexity is free. So this is an example from Oak Ridge, um, way back when we first started in 3D printing, we were working with titanium electron beam melting. And this was a design by my boss, Lenny Love, who is a roboticist and um, really solved the potential here with additive manufacturing to make some really complex things. So this is a cool hand. You can see that cellular geometry on the surface. Um, it makes it really stiff, but still really, really lightweight, perfect for robotics. But that's not actually the cool part of this art, of this hand. The cool part is that this is hydraulically powered and all the hydraulics are already plumbed into that print. So there's no assembly here. Um, there's no, you know, there is machining to fit in some of the moving components, but um, for the most part, all those lines are already there. Um, so that's just a real testament to additive. This is something you really couldn't do before. And then scaling that up to a larger set of arms that we built for the Navy um, to dive with. Um, there, these are hydraulically powered too. Hydraulics are notorious for being difficult to package. Um, that complex, those complex lines of hoses, it's not like a normal uh, electric robot where you have just a set of wires per actuator, it's way different. So we get that for free with additive. 
Um, the second principle with variety is free. So with that plastic BAM technology, there's just so many different things that we've printed. We've had so many uh, amazing partners. So Jen mentioned um, uh, the sub that we printed for the Navy. Um, we printed, um, as you see on the top left, these forms for uh, carbon fiber layup for aerospace. So these complex contours that go on the aircraft. For transportation, we've printed this um, neat little autonomous bus that's called Grover. Um, so the whole shell is 3D printed with plastic BAM. We've done a lot of work 3D printing wind turbine blade molds that have actually is a killer application. Um, it's a lot faster, cheaper to print them versus carve them out like they normally do. Um, for construction, we've built molds for the concrete window panes that have gone into the Domino's building and in, in uh, Brooklyn. Uh, for architecture, we've helped to print this uh, pavilion. It uses bamboo derived uh, fiber, so it's biodegradable. Um, we mentioned the sub. Um, there's just so many different applications and it all comes from one printer. Can you believe that? Um, one printer did all of these different things. So that's really one of the, the major powers of active manufacturing. Precise replication. So this was an engine head that we, um, one of our research was needing to be replaced. Uh, it was so old, there was no way they were gonna get a new one cast for any reasonable amount of money. We were able to cut the block open, take measurements, um, print it out. And then using um, binder jetting technology and our partners at X1, we were able to um, print the two halves, clean out the, the powder, and then fuse them back together using um, the bronze infiltration. And so um, we were able to precisely replicate their engine block, engine head for them, and they were able to, to do their experiments. So when we talked about portable manufacturing, I wanted to bring up um, our newest technology, which is SkyBAM. Um, so we have all these different BAMs. So there's um, metal BAM, SkyBAM, plastic BAM, they're all BAMs, so big area out of manufacturing. Um, but this is a crane-based system. It works a lot like that camera at the Super Bowl that flies around on cables. Um, but you, you, the idea is that you can drive in all of the different components, put them in place, set all the cabling up, and then you can begin to print. And all of, all of the components can fit on the back of a flatbed or all the components drive in themselves. So you get a crane, you get a concrete pump truck, you get these um, shipping containers, um, set everything up, and you have this very, very portable um, manufacturing uh, machine. So this is the SkyBam in action on a subscale. This is actually indoors set up with our internal crane, so it's not the full scale. Um, but this is uh, another principle, no assembly required, where we are building this, um, it's called the Empower Wall. So this is a, a thermal um, storage wall where we are pumping in energy. So you can pump in cooling, or you can pump in heat um, during low energy peak hours. And um, the wall will store that energy for when energy is more expensive later. And so as you can see here, the, the layers are being printed and those pipings, those pipes are being embedded as the print goes. So after the fact, everything's already done. We don't have to assemble afterward. Um, low cost, this is a demonstration that we did um, with binder jetting again. So my, my area of uh, research is binder jetting. So there's a lot of those examples, um, but we are, printing H13 tool steel, which is a very popular common uh, hot work tool steel, and centering it to full density, which is kind of a new concept for binder jetting. Um, most people are used to the idea that um, you're infiltrating a steel with bronze, but that's not the limit. You can, you can um, center these to full density if you know what you're doing. Um, but what was the, the low cost part of this was we were able to make this tool at around $700. Um, which is cheap for the tool itself, but we added this conformal cooling on the inside of the tool. And that in itself would have been another $700 at least if you were to do this with traditional manufacturing. But since we can add that into the model for free and the printer can print it for free, um, we can make these very high performance tools. Um, obviously this performs a lot high, uh, better because it has this conformal cooling. Um, we can make these high per performance tools for, for low cost. Uh, the other principle is less waste. So I'd like to introduce to you this um, metal band technology that we've been working on for a couple years now. It's just a, a welding technology, robotic welding in 3D. Um, there's actually a lot of uh, math and programming that goes into this. Um, they have to um, compensate for the welding process. It's very uneven. And so they have to use a lot of uh, data analytics and, and modeling simulation and feedback control to, to get this to print this, hot, this tall. Um, excuse me, let me go back. Um, so, but the idea here is that we can print these things like this excavator, excavator boom 
um, with just using the material that we need. There's like zero wasted material here. We just print exactly the geometry that we want. And we demonstrated that um, at a conference as well. And then when you think about that and producing things like um, this propeller for like the baby, um, you know, those, those manufacturing propellers is traditionally months and months and months of time, um, but we can make one and, you know, in a couple of weeks. So um, this is just the idea that, you know, we don't have to carve things down and we can get the exact geometry that we want while producing less waste. And I don't know if, um, if you saw, but we we're actually able to plumb in some hydraulic lines <laughs> into the print itself, which is another added feature. We didn't end up using that, but it was just a demonstration of the concept. Okay, so um, for this last principle, infinite shades of material. So if you're not used to looking at microstructures, I'll try to like um, spell this out for you, but um, the microstructure is the actual kind of arrangement of the material in the microscope. So it's like very, you know, you won't be able to see a microstructure um, with the naked eye. Um, but the idea is that the microstructure is what gives you your material properties and all the heat treatments and post-processing and everything that you do to a material um, to make it certified is all about this microstructure. So traditionally, um, until now, you have no control <laughs> over local parts of the microstructure. You just pretty much get what you get. Um, you treat a whole bulk of material and the microstructure um, you know, is what it is. Well, since with additive manufacturing, we have access to every little bit of the part. We can add energy, more energy here, less energy there, and we can change that microstructure by controlling the energy that we give the part. And so what you see here is a microstructure that has been controlled to spell DOE for Department of Energy. And if you were to look through this microstructure, what you would see um, that is spelling the words is what's called a, uh, um, a I'm losing my words. <laughs> it's it's a straight uh, microstructure, um, a columnar microstructure that I was thinking of. So it's columns of, of of crystals, and then the rest of this is what we call equiaxial, more kind of uh, spherical microstructure. Um, and so this is, to our knowledge, the, the first time this has ever been done in the world. <laughs> and so this is a really really big development. So you think about optimizing the topology of parts. Um, just with their macrostructure, with their design, now we can do it with the microstructure itself and optimize the microstructure for the application as well. Um, another principle is um, no constraints. I'm going to stretch this concept to the idea that we have no constraints in terms of the monitoring and qualification that we can do during the print. So this is an example of um, a, an event that can happen in a powder bed process where um, it's called short spreading, where you don't have enough powder that came out of the hopper and your part, your layer is starved. So we've demonstrated that the computer can recognize this issue as highlighted in purple um, and change some settings on the hopper and recoder to accommodate for this and correct for it so the build can survive. Maybe that one part on the side won't survive, but uh, the rest of the parts will survive. Um, and then taking that forward to our most recent uh, development, in um, printed nuclear reactors. So we're working on this um, subscale, this uh, a small portable nuclear reactor um, for you know, potentially local power generation. Um, but you can see how we can watch every bit of this thing being built. We have the thermal profile of all the material in the space. And so we can use that information to create a digital twin. Um, I'm not gonna dive into that too much, but the digital twin is basically a compilation of all the information on the material so that we can predict its performance um, before it's even shipped out the door. And so I wanted to kind of step into this idea of manufacturing 4.0 and how all of these concepts and principles contribute to that factory of the future. Um, so if you're not familiar with manufacturing 4.0, it's basically the idea that we're in the fourth industrial revolution and a lot of our technology is now based on cyber physical systems. Um, so what does that mean? So you get your customer order online, um, you design, manufacture, you have simulations, you have optimization, and you can actually simulate your manufacturing process itself before you hit the start button so that you can um, know that you're going to get what you want. And then, as I had said before, you have the opportunity to qualify and certify your part in the, in the process um, based on your simulations and your in-situ monitoring, and you can produce this digital twin that can help you troubleshoot in the future 
or certify your part as well. And then I think this is the funny one. Um, obviously, this is not part of our research, but you just dial up your Uber, uh, your autonomous Uber comes over, picks up the part, takes it to your customer. Um, and then, you know, perhaps you can embed something into the part. See, so we were embedding, um, you know, those tubes into the concrete print. Who's to say you couldn't put sensors in that? Um, and you can get, you know, performance tracking and feedback. You can use all of that information to innovate and improve. And now we have data-driven products and services that we, at a level that we've never had before. And that is the term everyone's using called democratization. Um, and the goal of that is that we can innovate faster than the competition can copy. Um, so I think that's just a really cool uh, vision for the future. Um, and uh, we at Oak Ridge are working on the components of all of this. I just didn't have time to cover it. I did want to dive into my specific research. Um, this is a women in 3D print conference, so we want to talk about what we're doing. So I work in binder jetting. Um, we print metal powders with an inkjet print head. So we spread a layer of metal powder, inkjet a binder into that. And what we get is this preform, kind of like a piece of pottery before it's fired. Um, so to fire the part, we can, as I said before, infiltrate it with a metal that's at a lower melting temperature. So typically we'll do bronze and steel, or we can center it or fire it to full density. There's some shrinkage, there's some issues with that, um, but they have demonstrated that you can get um, fully dense single alloy parts um, more recently with this process. So um, we have done a lot of work with binder jetting. There's a lot of different um, metal matrix composites or infiltrated materials we've worked with. This is a, a failure that I like to show because it's it's just kind of funny to me. It was something that we had tried. We wanted to demonstrate. We knew we could do tungsten carbide cobalt, um, which is a mining uh, bit material. Um, we just, you know, we wanted to get to the finish line very quickly. And we learned a lot along the way that um, about microstructure and chemistry of, of this material system in this, in this um, particular scenario. Uh, but anyway, we, we were able to uh, solve the problems with this. But this just goes to show you how science doesn't always work out. But we learned the most from our failures. Um, but we've done these uh, ticarbide steel gradient structures. So if you pause the print, switch out your powder, keep printing, you can, you can have gradients of properties. So this is where we um, were able to tailor the hardness throughout the part. So we printed the ticarbide in different, different compositions and then infiltrated with steel and tested the hardness. Um, we do a lot of development <clears throat> in binders. We did a, a binder for sand uh, a couple years ago and got an R&D 100 award. Um, through our partnership with X1, <clears throat> excuse me. And um, we have done infiltrations of silicon carbide with silicon to um, produce high temperature heat exchangers. We printed um, highly reactive lanthanides for magnetic refrigeration, uh, magnetics themselves. And then we've even done work on embedding fuel surrogates where you can pause the print, um, embed pieces, continue to print, consolidate it later. Um, and then also the H13 tool that I mentioned before. So this is a cool little animation of our embedded surrogate fuels. Um, most recently, we have been able to demonstrate the infiltration of printed B4C, which is boron carbide. It's a really, really great neutron absorbing material. So we have the world's most energy intense or most um, intense neutron beam. Um, we can make these custom call. We were trying to figure out a way to print collimators or these neutron absorbing geometries uh, so that the scientists can get better data. And we figured out that, hey, we can not only print B4C, we can infiltrate with aluminum um, and make this um, actually kind of useful material with binder jet. Um, it's a lightweight material. So uh, just got that one licensed by X1 as press release yesterday and really excited about that material. <laughs> and last, I'll close up. Um, just a quick plug for me and my uh, colleague, Cindy Waters. We wrote a book, uh, Additive Manufacturing for Designers, um, from SAE. Um, it's a really good um, beginner book. So if you wanted to get into additive manufacturing, it's an overview of all the different processes and the design considerations that you need. So um, with that, I thank you for your time, and I will be happy to take any questions. All right. Great talk, Amy. And you've got lots of questions. Uh, okay, great. All right, let's see if we can start with a few here. Um, what AM technology was used to produce the site-specific microstructure? That was electron beam melting, the powder bed process. 
Okay. Um, beautiful microstructure. How do you monitor control the heat distribution in order to create it? So we actually, they actually did that through simulation first. Um, so they simulated all the thermal events, all, all of that before it happened to come up with the exact right um, scan strategy to get that microstructure. That's a good question. Okay. Another good one here. What software for workflow do you use or do you develop your own? Uh, we have a lot of partners uh, where we're developing workflow, um, but we just, honestly, right now, we do a lot of just normal CAD packages. Uh, sustainability question again, this time for you. What initiatives are you guys working on at Oak Ridge? So a lot of our uh, plastic work has to do with sustainability. So we actually have a carbon fiber manufacturing facility. We have um, a lot of things that we work with on the tooling front. So we have a lot of big plastic things. So we're really working on, um, as I mentioned before, uh, we have this bamboo derived plastic that you, you know, um, when you print these wind turbine blade molds, they're massive, right? And they have a limited number of cycles that they can perform. And so you think about, um, you know, having these big tools, what do you do with them? Well, with the, the bamboo derived polymer, you can bury it and then it's decomposed in 20 years. All right, and the one last question here. Um, my company using three, recycled biomaterial to create 3D printed affordable housing. What are the research resources that you recommend us to use or connect with? Um, let's see, we, we are working on the, like I said, the Skyban project. That might actually be a feasible solution um, for, for that affordable housing. Great. You can go to um, our website, Ornell. Um, Org, or or sorry. All right, I guess we got time for another one. Okay. Um, what programs are you using for thermal simulation? Uh, we use a lot of ANSYS. Um, I think there are a few other ones, but I don't work with that part of it. Um, however, you can you can send me a, a message, and I can get you in contact with the scientist that does. So. All right, and do you work with elastic three D printing materials? Uh, sometimes, yes. <laughs> sometimes. But most of the applications we work with don't, don't require elastics, but they're kind of fun to work with. All right, great. Well, thank you so much, Amy. And uh, I think we'll take a quick break and we'll go out and then we'll come back in. All right, thank you so much. All right, see you guys soon.